Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And we're going to be joined shortly by France second row and former South Africa under 20 international, Paul Willemser, to look ahead to a huge World Cup quarterfinal between France and the Springboks on Sunday night. How is your week though, Johnny? And before you start, we've got to share with everyone. We're going to lift the curtain. We're not going to hide it. What has been going on? Admin, good, yeah? It's been good, generally. Uh, Scotland now out, so things quiet down a little bit for me, mate. There'll be less following Scotland, more following the other teams, which is cool. Um, and this week, actually, is the first week since the comp started that I've had. I got back on Tuesday night, and I've got like four days at home with the family. So it's actually just really nice to catch up, get everything organised or disorganised. We were just having a laugh. <laughs> Because I'm a Muppet. Fill us in. Verifying all the flights for next week. Because obviously I'm in Marseille and I'm in Paris and doing lots of different bits and bobs. As a treat, we told the kids last night we were taking them to watch France against South Africa. Um, so they're pumped. We, we got tickets and we've booked the flights. Everything's been booked. You know, ver- verifying my flights. And I was just verifying whilst doing other admin my flights about four hours ago. Um And I don't know how, in putting my phone back in my pocket, I've cancelled all the family's flights. So I've been on hold with Air France for about the past two hours trying to get it sorted. And it turns out all I can do is just book the same flights that I've just given them back again for a £1,000. So that's how my admin's going. Another grand down. um, But still looking forward to making some memories, whether they're positive or negative ones, I don't know yet. Um, But yeah, mate, can't wait. Looking forward to it. But yeah. Bit of a mistake with the flights. Mrs. isn't delighted. I'm not too happy either, but (laughs) these things happen. What are you going to do? This is not my phrase, but I've heard other people say these things, Johnny, you've just got to write them off. They call them the idiot tax. My my missus came up with something slightly more colourful and creative. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not going to lie. But idiot tax is a nice way of putting it. Absolutely. We will obviously chat much more about the game when we get Paul on, but we are recording this before Fabian Galtier announces his team selection. There mm-hmm. aren't going to be any surprises, though, are there? Obviously, Marchand is still out. Dupont is going to be back and is going to start, right? Well, it looks like Antoine is training, sitting people down. If you look at the social media, sitting down, I mean, how bad is that? Um, <laughs> showing that he's ready to the spring box, but love it. It made me laugh a little bit. Sitting down, Mathieu Jalibar in training. He's wearing a scrum cap. Um, he looks like he'll be back in terms of selection. <sighs> No real surprise. I think it's going to be too tight for Julien Marchand. It looks like it will be a 6-2 bench from what they're showing at training. And Makalu will be in instead of um, Melvin Jaminet. Biai Barry looks like he's keeping his place. And you mentioned Dupont has been wearing a scrum cap in training, Johnny. Is he going to be wearing it for the game? Is he going to be wearing a mask? Is he going to be wearing anything? I guess we don't know. You know what? He's been training with a scrum cap. You'd think if he's going to wear anything else, he'd be wearing it in training. So... He's obviously just wearing a scrum cap. Um, but how much protection that actually gives for the area of his face that he's broken? I don't know how much it gives me. Or if it's just a comfort thing, I've got no idea. But obviously, structurally, that isn't going to have much of an impact on the area that he's injured. Um, but that's what he's training with. And it looks like that's what he's going to hit out with. So if that gives him a little bit of confidence, then so be it. Have you worn one? I mean, obviously you're not a scrum half, but does it affect I hate for, it. for a vision? I hate, hate it, mate. I hate in that it was constantly it, weird in that I'm quite weird anyway, but I hate having <laughs> something under my chin. I hate not being able to hear properly. I hate not peripheral vision. It just, I, I found it took like a little edge away from me in the way that I could communicate and see around me. Obviously that's not the case for everyone because there's loads of players that absolutely love having them, but it wasn't for me. Um, and I can't remember Antoine having played with one previously in the top 14 or even youth setup. So it'll be a first time for him as well, I'd imagine. Um, and yeah, it isn't always easy, especially not in a decision-making position where you have to keep your wits about you, be chatting all the time. Um, yeah, not straightforward. Let's get our guest on now then. Well, more friend of a show, I guess. And the perfect man to look ahead to this quarterfinal between France and the Springboks. France second row, Paul Willemster joins us. How you doing? Hey, fine. Thanks and you guys. We're good. Well, actually, I'm good. Johnny? I'm a thousand euros down, but apart from that, I'm fine. It's not like my ego's hurt. I'll get over it. It's fine. We apologise. Paul and I have been sat on a twiddling our thumbs for about an hour and a half, but it's okay, uh, Johnny. Don't worry. It's fine, honestly. 
I owe you both a beer. I apologize. Let's start with the positives, Paul. You're back fit. You're saying you're training in Corsica, are you? So you're fit, you're ready. If anyone goes down injured with France as well. Yeah, yeah. Basically, last week I got cleared. So just sent the message through to the to the French staff that um, I'm all good to go. So whenever you guys need me, I'll be ready. And then, uh, yeah, I fell in with uh, my club, Montpellier, um, on the camp they had this week. So I'm training with them and then might play this weekend. Um, just a good 40 minutes to get back into it. So it will do me good because I haven't been playing in a while. So, yeah, I know. Really fit, oh, fit and back, back playing rugby again. So it's good. Good man. The rugby aside, let's park that. I want to know about Corsica because it's on my list of places to go. I'm desperate to get there on holiday. What's it been like? Corsica as a place, as an island. Have you been there before? And what have you made of the island so far? Yeah, we normally with Montpellier the last few years, we've came here every, every year to do a stage. Um, but yeah, it's like the typical rugby scenario. You know, you don't really get that much time to go and, you know, you're not coming for holiday. So, so no, we've been just been around. We had a cool um, four by four, all the quads and stuff. We did a, a day that we went out on it. That was really quite fun. And then spent some time at the beach. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really nice here. Nice atmosphere. It's not, not the worst place in the world to do a rugby can. <laughs> and obviously the positives are that you are back now. You're ready. The body is good, but everyone knows the background. Just give us an insight into what it's been like kind of on the sidelines, watching the pool stages, because you've been such a massive part of this front side for the last four years. Then to experience what happened on the eve of the tournament, what's it been like watching from the outside? Yeah, no, obviously from, well, from the start, which was made basically the week before the New Zealand game, the opener where we basically just had a week off and I had to do a few sessions by myself. And I did my running session halfway through and I just felt my leg, my quad, get a small tear. So yeah, that started off like that. And then obviously that next week didn't go as nicely <laughs> with me emotionally and all that. So I had to deal with that, um, got through it. Uh, and um, yeah, since then, Kind of just put all my energy and all the frustration back into now while just dealing with all those things that are in my hands. So just focusing on getting back because this from the start, I knew what was speaking with the coaching staff and all that, that there's a possibility to come back. Um, so I knew, okay, then it's not finished yet. There's still a chance. So just do everything you can to be back. So, yeah, I've been basically just throwing myself into the rehab and doing everything I can to get back as quickly as possible. And then while while doing that, the games have been going on, and I've been watching the boys, watching the world the World Cup, um, yeah, with the frust frustration and uh, lots of joy as well, because they've been doing well. Um, but yeah, you kind of have that uh, that kind of realization again that I'm not supposed to be a supporter. <laughs> I, I'm supposed to be there on the field. That's a bit in the back of your head. So yeah, it's a bit difficult and interesting. But yeah, no, I'm doing really well and enjoying watching the games. Um, and then yeah, we see being behind the boy, being behind the French team with all the games, which well, it's kind of ramping up now. It's difficult though. Like you kind of mentioned it. It's difficult. It's always horrible when we're watching. We want to play. Like that is the way it is. It's been horrific timing for you again. The positive news is you're back running, you're playing this weekend, game time, you're in touch with the camp. If they make it through the quarters, you're free and available for semis and finals. That's the overwhelming light of the tunnel. And that'd be the joy and happiness that we'd all have if it was to happen. And I know it can't have been easy watching the games, but what if you made generally, like opening game, the All Blacks would have been the hardest one to watch, difficult. And just the sort of way they've gone about their business as well. What have you made of the performances? Yeah, I think it was a bit difficult to to actually show um, with our pool, to actually show what we, uh, at what level level we are exactly, because uh, besides the New Zealand game, um, the games weren't really that challenging. And especially wasn't, there wasn't the game like there was with the South African Island group, where they had that massive, massive game, which really impressed everyone. You're talking there about the Scottish test matches, obviously, <laughs> Bolly. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that one as well. That was it's really revealing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so yeah, um, so it's been quite difficult to actually show, and I've been actually seeing that uh, yeah, it, it kind of feels like all the attention is being shifted off of uh, um, France, and it's being more put on South Africa, uh, South Africa and Ireland, which is normal because they had a pretty well, a pretty awesome test match. Um, so yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's interesting to see how it all flows. But yeah, the performance of the French team was like I felt like they did they did whatever they could have done. Um, obviously, the Uruguay game was a bit of a difficult one, and uh, where they kind of swapped a few guys out, and then yeah, but it, in my head, it's always difficult to to be ready for for those types of games. Um, where it's not a big country and to get up for it, which you you need to be, well, I'll give you that. But but yeah, it's always difficult to be mentally prepared for those type of games because it can be really frustrating to play against those type of teams because they do certain things that you are not used to see in the in, in like in Six Nations. There's certain stuff that happens on a on the field that it's a bit throws you off. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, besides the Uruguay game, I felt like you know. The front showed exactly what they what well they used well what they were given uh, in terms of games, um, but yeah, the real test will be from now on, like the, the quarters and, and 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 so on. We will find out on Sunday night, but it's a fascinating contrast, isn't it? Because you got South Africa; they had a week off at the end of the pool stages, but before that, they'd had some serious tests, including Scotland. Johnny, don't worry, they were in there. And, you know, New Zealand have also had a period where they've been playing lesser sides and they've got to face Ireland who have had really tough test after tough test. So there's no right or wrong, but we'll find out this weekend what the best preparation is, I guess. Yeah, I, yeah it's very really difficult to measure teams in when there's such a big gap between them in the, during the pool stages, which, you know, but it was kind of interesting for me because uh, you will always find out, like, it's interesting to see when it starts getting now serious how all the all the all the teams are fighting to be the underdog again. You know, <laughs> like everybody loves to be the underdog. Um, uh, so I've seen I've seen a bit like like I told you the I've seen the 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 light that's been taken a little bit off of uh, France, um, which which is good. Like um, I think it will only benefit the French team to just. Uh, remind everybody again why why we what we've built the last four years just a couple of things on you paul before we move on to talking a bit more about the game firstly i remember when we had you on before and we were talking about injuries you said you had a spell which could be very short or could be a little bit longer where you had everything in sight before you smashed the rehab so how long was that this time what did you eat yeah so this <laughs> this time it took about a week Okay. It took, about, it took about a week to to uh, work through everything, work through all the motions, and it took about like I think four big barbecues, um, <laughs> and a lot of a lot of alone time to to work through everything and um, yeah, just get my head on straight back, yeah, and then just let me let me live through all those emotions because yeah, obviously. If you've had a build up of four years, and even before that, I've been building up in this in my head, like since you were five years old, you know, like playing in the World Cups. So, yeah, it's it's difficult. It's it's really difficult. But yeah, I I I had some, <laughs> I had some I had some good barbecues and I had some uh, difficult times. Um, yeah, but luckily my my wife, my family, everyone was around me to to share the pain uh, and. Uh, the sadness with it but yeah no, it's like it's one of those things that you can what can you do you, can, you just need to go to move forward and make the best of, of uh, what you have so yeah good i'm glad the meat did the trick and also yeah. i'm sure some of this was before the injury some of it might have been out but every cloud is a silver lining you spent a bit of time with johnny recording some stuff so you know i don't know if that's uh, good or bad what did you do with johnny uh, fill us in yeah, no, we had a we had a few emotional moments together as well. You know, we really bonded. So <laughs> on a boat, on the on the on the ocean. So yeah, we we really used that time as well. It was part of my healing process. Like, like uh, how long was the 
video in the end with Paul and how many days did you spend with him? Because we went through this with Bernie, you, you know, you three, four days, long lunches, eight minutes in the end. The same Look, deal here? Some of the best times of my life. Think of this <laughs> one as a little bit Titanic, a little bit broke back. Uh, mountain and it was a good time it was bonding we had a nice time a couple of beers some good food um and yeah that's it everything gets condensed condensed into like seven eight minutes um mm. but it was good fun man it was good and like i've spent quite a bit of time we filmed together in marseille and i've been there every monday since filming stuff so um it's a good part of the world it was fun but it was good crack um but that was back in june like it was ages ago yeah that's the that's the 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 ba- one of the good parts about rugby you know and I was glad I had to do that because um, sometimes you, you sometimes you take it a little bit too seriously. It's good, but you got Johnny's budget behind you as well to do a few days at it. Always good, yeah. 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 He, he writes your checks, Johnny. But <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get paid, but Paul got paid. Let me just make make that clear. I didn't get paid, but Paulie does. <laughs> On a more important note, in a serious note, you mentioned that you've obviously told Fabian you're available, everything's all good, all clear. Uh, presumably during the whole process, you've been involved though, right? You've been in touch, like you haven't been shut out, you've been in contact with the coaching staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been keeping contact with the coaches like once a week and um, obviously in the beginning a bit more, but um, more so with the medical staff, like just following my progression, my GPA stats and all that, uh, how everything's progressing. But yeah, the thing from the start was just Paul. Um, let us know uh, when you 100. percent We want to get there as soon as possible because they, yeah, the whole thing was a bit, um, yeah, it was a bit crazy because um, I got injured just before they had they had to hand in the the final squad, uh, World Cup squad to World Rugby. So it meant like uh, if they took me, they already had a few other injured players that they made in the squad and because I got injured like just in that week um, before they didn't want to take the risk of like going into a World Cup with four injured players so well we kind of made the decision um, put me on the bench or on the reserve list so then it means that I can can go back in because they didn't want I, you know, I guess they don't want a scenario where first game uh, my lock gets injured and now we're stuck we don't we don't have guys to put on the field um yeah so that was the whole scenario but then yeah being in contact with them most of the weeks uh just until last week where i just had the final final check mark and said okay i'm good to go so you know now now it's out of my hands so we'll see what happens um yeah i yeah, really hope for it uh well hope for an opportunity so i can get back um because I really made sure that I'm ready. If if the possibility comes across, you always need to be ready for that. But yeah, kind of like I said, when I work through it, um, kind of make peace with it that if it doesn't happen, it's okay. We'll survive. It's not the worst thing in the world, but uh, still have a little bit of hope that, that it will be possible to come back. And aside from the coaches, have you spoken to the players this week or last week? Presumably the excitement is building and they're just, they're obviously ready, but uh, have you got a vibe for what it's like in camp? Yeah, not really. You know, it's like a typical thing when you get injured, like the bus goes on, they drop you off and the bus, bus goes on. It's one of the worst parts of being injured in, in the rugby scene or in the sports scene. So, yeah, but um, yeah, I've been kind of just following what's being said, like everyone in the media and all that. And I also know because... Um, We've been like knowing that there would be a possibility to play them, most probably either them or, or Ireland in the quarterfinals. So I know they've been preparing like a few weeks ago while playing the other games. They've been starting to start to, starting to look at look at the South African team. So yeah, um, obviously, yeah, I think I'm gonna, it's going to be really, and I'm really excited for this match because uh, for this match because it's going to be like the one of the first big tests for, for us in this in this tournament. It's going to be absolutely huge. Let's get into why. Like two huge sides, physical, similar blitzing styles. What do you think is going to be the difference between these two sides? I was thinking about it the other day and I was saying like one thing that was you know, a bit weird for me was in the in the in the island game where South Africa went for the seven one bench, but then all the all the penalty opportunities that they had, they didn't go for touch. And I mean, like that's normally why you would go with that 7-1 split. 
to attack those set pieces, you know. So it was a bit weird that they didn't do that. Um, but I know for a fact that they're going to do that against us, you know, like, and that's quite kind of what you're going to expect from them. You know, thinking that they're going to attack you know, the other uh, set pieces really, really hard, go for that, make sure that, because uh, uh, give them a good base for, for their backs to do their thing. And then well, for the French team, um, I think that the thing that really worked well for them that I've been picking up like this last few 10 test matches that they've had, is like you really start seeing how the the balance between the forwards and the backs and the way they play together start start really working nicely. And I think that's that might be the, the thing that they have more than South Africa where they're not that reliant on on the forwards. Um, and it's basically as soon as the the op opposition team blocks the forwards, the backs start doing, there's some holes opening up for the backs. And as soon as they, they start blocking the backs, the forwards start having some op uh, opportunities. So I think for the French team is that the, the balance between the forward play and back plays, like it feels like everyone's like in kind of the same level. And even the forwards know exactly what scenario the backs would prefer. So when they're getting that, they make sure that the get, backs get the ball. And it feels like the the backs understand what scenario the forwards would like to play. So I think they they help it while they um, it works it gels nicely at the moment um, for their play. Whereas in South Africa, I think they they're really going to focus on the set pieces against us and try to break us in front of them. So on that, if you're going seven one, or even if you're going six two against France, we've seen they've left points out there. Goal kicking hasn't quite been there with Libok. If you were Razi Erasmus this weekend and you're playing against France, would you go for Andre Pollard as your starting 10 or would you go for Libok? That's I think that's gonna be the I think all the South African supporters are also it's a big discussion. <laughs> Cause uh, I think Bonnie Libok did an awesome job um like in his general play. I think he brings something to the team that Andre doesn't and vice versa. So I think I actually heard Rassi speak this week and he said like where they don't they don't just pick uh, the best player in the position. They actually pick, um, in, they actually look in regards to how certain players complement complement each other and what players types, play style they want for this weekend. So that's, that's going to be interesting because I know like there's a good backline with Andre Pollard in it, and there's also a good backline with uh, Marty Leblanc in it. So yeah, what they're gonna do against France? I'm not actually. I'm not quite sure. I guess if you wanna you wanna play a typical knockout rugby, you need to make sure that those penalties you get those three three points. Um, yeah, you know, which yeah, it's gonna be really vital, and I I think you they saw it against uh, Ireland as well. But knowing Rossi, he could just flip it on his head and just go all in and say, "No, we're gonna, we're gonna play. We're gonna go to the corner every single time." So yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see. And you say you're fairly sure they're gonna go with a seven-one split, or it could be a six-two split. Rossi or Jack Nino, but together they have delayed their team selection. They normally name their team very early on in the week. We're sat here now, and they haven't named it as we're recording this. Is that? kind of the ultimate mark of respect to France or what's the thinking behind that do we think it's it's a typical Rossi mind games which is always fun um but I don't think it would bother the French team that uh, that much you know like since I've been there it's always been about it's always been about like us about our team and what we need to do uh to to make sure that we play to the max of our possibilities and I think that could stay the same. I don't think we adapt that much towards um, the teams that we play. Um, it doesn't change that much. So it might change a few set piece launches from scrums or lineouts or or small things like that. But in a big bigger picture, well, it doesn't matter what team they're going to play. You know that you're going to expect the rucks to be a slaughter, and you're going to expect the ball carries to be insane. And the physicality to be insane, and that's not going to change. It doesn't matter what they play. So I mean, you just prepare for that, and that's all you can do. Did you play with Dion Fury? No, I played against him. Yeah, you know, I think a few times. So like once Marks got injured and picked up that ACL 
injury, mm-hmm. which is obviously devastating for him. What did you make of the decision not to go for a specialist hooker, but to take Dion Fury and, and Marco Van Staden, one of which, or one of whom has played hooker, but like not mm-hmm. recognized? That's also ballsy, is it not? Yeah, I think, but I think it was the same scenario where the the injury and the kind of um had Andre Polo there at the back waiting for an injury and I think they used that card to get him back in. Um which was I think a good des- decision. And then if you look at the pack as well, Dion Free is a solid player and I think he, he was in the team because he can cover Hooker and lose forward. Uh and number eight as well. So yeah he can he can cover a few positions. And when you're in that that kind of team, he's uh, might say that he's not a specialist lineup thrower, um, but he what he brings on the field is awesome. So yeah, I think that small weakness that he brings, I think in a in a eighth man in a eight man pack with the forwards they have, I think they they you you won't that little weakness won't have that big of an effect if everybody's on form and everybody's uh, bringing it. And I, and he actually showed it when he got the man of a man of the match uh, performance so he's an awesome player and uh yeah he he, he he did well in my eyes like he did really well like it line outs would be a challenge for him but yeah it's not that big of a weakness for them yeah it's a bit like the 7-1 split johnny i mean he was a hooker until about five six years ago he can clearly still do it but it it's okay if it goes well if Manambi goes down injured in the first 10, 15 minutes, it all of a sudden doesn't look too smart. It's insane. But then the fact they clearly <laughs> back his skill set, he's clearly good enough. Otherwise, they, like Razi mm-hmm. doesn't come across as a coach that isn't smart or is going on gut. Like He's statistically based. He's clearly gone on the fact that he believes that guy's got throw quality that's good enough to play and win a World Cup. Otherwise, he wouldn't be there. Like He's not daft. The one area in the big battle I really want to pick your brains about is the second row battles. You got Woki and Flamand going up against probably Etzebeth and Mostert. Like, how do you see that mini battle within the game going? Yeah, if you say that type of roles that they play are really different. Um because um yeah, Woki is like a loose forward and turned lock. And Flamand has his awesome running lines and he's looking for that. Um but then you're on the other side, you get Mostert, which is just a, a workforce, a workhorse in the, on the field, just going from action to action, uh, keeping his same rhythm in the game and just going from rock to rock to tackle to tackle. And then, yeah, you've got uh, Itzabet, who's also capable of doing um, big actions in the game and uh, big momentum changes. So, yeah, um, yeah. But you're going to have to kind of look at the whole pack in a in a, in a in a bigger scale, like seeing how the both backs have certain roles which complement complement each other, because uh, now you, we have a lighter lock, smaller locks than the spring box on, on on the especially the tight head pop. But then we have big towel coming on from the bench, which can change things up. Then again, but then also we start with uh, Winnie Antonio, who makes up the weight in the scrum that you kind of lose from the lock. So when you look at all of that, it comes up pretty even in my eyes. Like uh, <laughs> It's not that, that big of a difference. Another even area. There's barely anything to choose between them anywhere. But on that, we have laughed with you in the past about how you're a proper second row, Paul. Cameron, Thibaut, yeah, they're, they're a bit of back row, a bit of second row. Uh, you could say the same about Franco Moster. He's played a lot of back row as well. It. Right. Have you kind of noticed, obviously from your in-depth knowledge of the position, but also the France setup, have you noticed that France are playing a bit differently without you there starting and without Roman Tafafanua there starting and with those two in the position? Is there a noticeable difference from what you're seeing? Well, that's yeah, a pretty difficult you, question to answer yeah, with that. They're, I'll, <laughs> they're, no, they're, no, they're no, noticeably worse. That's a loaded <laughs> question I'm going to answer yeah. for Paul because he can't yeah. answer that Yeah. yeah. I meant you touched on it. They're lighter. They are they are they tipping the ball on more? Are they not getting into those kind of confrontations because they haven't got a massive second row like either? Yeah, but that's exactly not. But like I said, now you lose you lose a little bit of the strength in the forward back with compared to maybe your lineouts and your and your scrums and maybe 
some rocks and like normally for me i pr uh, pride myself in making big defensive actions sometimes so that can change like the momentum of the, the attacking team and then just stop the launches dead and gives your uh, defense a bit of a breather and making melt the other guys make turnovers and all that with a big tackle and all but you don't have that now but then you add the some awesome skills in lineouts and all the other stuff that uh, walkie brings and, and flamo brings back so now now you're a bit more full on that side so yeah i guess yeah i guess like every team would love to have a, a big second rower in their team to do the physical stuff and yeah obviously I, <laughs> yeah, for me i would say i think it would have it, it would have been better if i was there uh, obviously, I, I need to say that. I need to believe that. But, uh, yeah, I don't, like I said, I think the, um, the other players help comp well, help complement each other and help fill the gaps that, that they, they might be. So I guess, yeah, I, I guess it changes in a bit. But, yeah, I would um, obviously love it if people tell me that, uh, yeah, no, that, that team needs you. The team needs we'll you. tell you. <laughs> it, it, hey, it it's not good, just... But, it's not just this French team. Every team would be better with a Paul Valencia in, at five. That's what I've written down as you were talking. Absolutely. Um, and Johnny, the, I don't know what you're worried about. That was the perfect diplomatic answer. I, the, yeah, we, yeah, I yeah. didn't team up there. Yeah. Smashed yeah. it. Um, and Paul, you mentioned, so you mentioned like the physicality, the set piece, what's coming from the spring box. You also talked around how maybe it wasn't too difficult. To pull, once that big game was out of the way, it was a bit of a breeze, wasn't it? So... If France are going to make it through this quarterfinal and make it into a semi, what do they have to nail? Because we've seen some outstanding play, um, expansive stuff against Namibia, like easy tries. But against South Africa, you have to win physicality and set piece. But what are the sort of add-on bits that are going to guarantee that they win this game? If they're going to win this game, what do they need to do? Yeah, well, first of all, your line of defence has to be on point against them, like I said, because I... Uh, I'm pretty sure they're going to try and attack us because um, we haven't been really tested um, that much in our line of drive defense. So we haven't been really tested heavily in a line of drive defense. And then the scrums, um, I think if they look at our previous games in the World Cup, um, they, would, they, would, they might think that there's a possibility for them to get a few penalties uh, in scrum time. So I think for them, the easiest the easiest uh, things to go for is the set pieces. Because um, like I said, we weren't really tested during the World Cup on those parts. And uh, so, yeah, I, but, I, but I would say that, that I think the French know, they know this and they would have spent this last few weeks just nailing that down and making sure because they know it's coming. Like it's not, it's not like you don't know what to expect from us on African from the spring box, you know. Um, so it's quite simple. But yeah, I think that's going to be that's going to be the big the big. Uh, if they are able to match the physicality in the line of drives uh, uh, and in the scrums, uh, it would it would make it really difficult for for the spring box. One other area that could be massive. Can you give us an insight into how big the kicking game is going to be? I know it might not be your area of specialty, yeah. but yeah. clearly it's a team uh, approach. And France have got a South African, Flock Killiers in there, and he obviously works very closely with Sean Edwards. So can you just give us an insight into yeah. uh, how that kind of works and, and who might have the edge there as well, I suppose, in the kicking game? Yeah, I think... I think that it will be a battle of um, who can keep their forwards the freshest um, from the both teams. Because, like, if you think at the end of the day, that's basically what your your kicking game is: is to not waste energy in places that you're not going to get any reward. Um, and then, especially with both teams that have big backs, uh, your your aim is to make sure you don't waste the energy um, having six or eight rocks in your own half. Uh, for nothing, and then possibly giving away a penalty when they, when you know, and the other team they have got good uh, stealers um, in the team. So, yeah, the, the, we talk about that's like the base of the kicking game. But like, yeah, I know both teams have a really good kicking game, and I think 
the fact that uh, Dupont is also going to be uh, be in the team will help that a lot. Um, and yeah, it's going to be that that battle of key, who can keep their forwards the freshest for the longest, because obviously you want to you want to start tiring them out, and they want to start uh, tiring us out, um, and then making sure uh, you don't take risks. Um, and then when you just for the big moment when you get to that first attacking launch that everybody's firing 100 percent to make sure you get get out of their half with some points so yeah that in that sense yeah the kicking game is going to be really really important and, and two sides that kick a lot right because mm. even more so you'd argue they would go into this game and they probably kick even more because like, if i was playing against france and i was playing into a blitz defense like i wouldn't want to run into that there's no point as a ball carrier, you just get smashed. The same running into the spring box, like you're running into a blitz defense. What's the point? So like you talk about that wastage of energy, I don't think we'll see either side play any rugby inside like their own 40, maybe up to 50 because mm. there's no point. And then it'll become a grind. Like whoever can win that game line, little edges, little penalties, that's the way the game will go. And it reminds me of the game. I don't think you played in the test in Marseille in 2022. It was just before that game, I think you picked up another injury. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But it was that type of game. The, the Springboks got a red card really early, but they're one of the few sides that can live with the French physicality because they're so physical themselves. Yeah. It'll just be such an interesting game and it'll be built around collisions and fit like it's yeah. going to be ridiculous. But then, then as well, then as well, you throw in the, the French uh, flair, which they are capable of doing just a normal classic ruck in the middle of the field and then all of a sudden, the bomb snipes or does a chip or does a handoff or something. Piet Mavako picks the ball up again next to the ruck and then that just creates a break and some chaos. And then as well, in the South African side, then you you have if Marnie Lubbock is playing or Chesson Colby, you know, just making an awesome break or catching the ball from a from a up and under or something like that crazy. Then, you know, so I think... I think we're going to see some amazing rugby. I really think that you're going to see some amazing things because that's that's what it's going to take to score against uh, either team. You're going to have to do some pretty amazing things. One of the players who's been finishing off a lot of those opportunities for France and has just had an insane last year or two is Damien Penne. You obviously yeah. know him well. We've laughed, I think, with you in the past about this, certainly with Benji on a week-to-week -week basis about what he's like as a personality. He's a bit of a kind of mad guy he's, he's his own man which is great have you noticed when you've been in camp over the past year or so that he's matured and he's is he still the same guy because i mean his form is just ridiculously yeah. good at the moment yeah no i could you could literally see during the past four years that he's been gaining experience like crazy um and obviously playing high test level rugby the amount of experience you gain from each small test is is uh, crazy so yeah he's as a, as a rugby player he's really he's really um matured and gained so much experience like the things just kind of look easier for him you know <laughs> uh but yeah as a player and as a guy of the field he's been exactly the same you know kind of a stiffler character you know? yeah. <laughs> doesn't take anything seriously always laughing uh always uh having a crack uh but then, yeah, when he turns to the games, it's like, it kind of feels like he just does what he, like, he's just natural. Like, he he just plays on, on feeling and, like, whatever he feels at that moment is right. And that's the cool thing, I think, from the French squad is that we kind of leave those possibilities open for players to, to have a go. And, well, if you feel this is what you're going to do, then everybody just jumps behind you and makes it work. So that kind of also helps a player like him, you know, like when you have those guys around you that, okay, we give you the ball, see what you're doing. If something happens, okay, we just go see if you can do anything. I can give uh, Antoine de Pont the ball, see what he can do. And then everybody goes from that. Or give um, Gilbert the ball, see what he can do. And everybody goes from that. So um, it kind of, there's some, there's, there is a space left in our game plan and in the way that we approach rugby that leaves you know, leaves the, the, the game open a bit to create stuff because I kind of get a sense like the our French way of playing is like if we sometimes don't know what, what's going to happen, then our the 
the team playing against us surely is not going to know what's going to happen. So we leave that so that it's not as strict and your game plan is not as predicted as possible because then other teams you've played, you've played against so many game plans and stuff. Normally, you just go into the VIP, you know exactly, you know, they're probably going to put up a rock here and another one here and then shift it and then kick it that side, you know, you kind of have these things, but um, we kind of leave it a little bit open and to see, you know, let's see what happens. And then we go from that. And I think that surprises some teams. And the door is open also for Damian to go on and potentially be the first man to get more than eight tries in Rugby yeah. World Cup history in one competition. Like, if the team stays in, he's got a decent chance of breaking that record as well, which would be absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, two tries. Eh? It's only two tries away to, to equal it. Um, yes, but I, I would love that for him. Herc, yeah. That would just yeah, make... Well, work is it feel in that this generation of French rugby is really special and like it just more reinforce the fact that this group of, of players that we have is really special and it's a uh, generational. So yeah, I would I would love for him to 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 break that record. That would be awesome. It's great. And whenever you mention his name, people who know him, you can see the smile come across their face before they answer the question. It's like, Damien Penno, yeah. And then everyone's got a story. But it's interesting because the, the scope is clearly there for someone like Damien, someone like Antoine, Mathieu Jalabert, whoever it is, to, to whether you call it go off script or not, to, to just do something special, which is great. But yet Fabian is obviously a meticulous coach as well. I just wanted to ask you about the difference between him and Razi Erasmus in a way because it's been very high profile in this World Cup albeit a little quirk or gimmick maybe the lights in the coaching box I mean I, I don't know whether whether they're a big thing whether they're another like Razi yeah. diversion but I mean shouldn't the players be making the decision on the pitch is it, it it's yeah, interesting he, he actually so when I grew up watching uh, Super Rugby and Curry Cup games in South Africa he was actually on the top of the stadium roof mm. um, when he coached the cheetahs on the on the on the stadium roof, uh, like shining lights <laughs> to to help the guys in the field. So yeah, I, like I've never been in that situation. Oh well, I haven't been in that um, in that coaching or in that team and stuff. So I don't exactly know what what type of things. I I think it might be just some general general um advice like are you going for three points or the or the or the touch on a penalty or are you going to maybe do a wide i would say maybe a, a middle or wide or blindside play maybe that type of thing so i don't know if you yeah you know, i guess it just helped, helped him feel that he is a bit more in control i don't know because i i guess that's the most frustrating part of a coach is just letting the players be on the be on the field and make their own choices i think that's well, coach, that's the part where like you don't have any control. So I don't know if that maybe helps him to feel like okay, no, listen, I can still have an impact uh, in the game because like since the past, you know, with the whole water boy thing and all that, you you know that he likes to be involved. So yeah, this is just I think it's just his style. I don't think it gives him a benefit to because if people complain about it, they actually give him a. Uh, a massive uh, compliment, you know, that, that he can actually help make the Springboks better on the field. But yeah, I don't think it's a big deal. I just think it's his coaching style. Um, it's the same with the seven one split thing when everybody made a big fuss. Um, and it for I think for everyone that actually understood rugby and understands what goes on, you you know, like if you do that, you're taking a massive risk. Yes, it can help you if everything works the way you think it's going to work, but you're also taking massive risk. So, yeah, all these things, it's just, uh, it's just who Rassi is. And um, it's one of the things they make him well. Uh, because uh, Fabian Galti also has his particular style. <laughs> and it's actually quite cool to see the different personalities. There is some heat from the players on the field. So if you're not quite sure, there's a 50-50, there's a leadership group that's split. It's the coach's decision. A plus in France, like every single bench, you see all the coaching staff on the side, like three point, like they make decisions on, on the sidelines yeah. anyway. So I, I think it's actually quite cool. It just means that the team can get on with like next job mentality and then the coach just makes the decision. I'm not against that at all. Whereas I've played with loads of captains that that would really piss off and that they are the captain. They've grown up making mm -hmm. decisions and they want to continue, but it wouldn't bother me. Like team choice, 
coach choice, whatever yeah. it is. Even with that, though, I, I think that he also leaves the possibility for the team to make a different decision if they feel on the field that like this feels different. It feels like we're going to have a go or or whatever so we've gone quite deep there we've covered every base we've talked tactics we've talked different matchups let's get a prediction what's going to happen well obviously i'm going to be biased it's <laughs> <laughs> like i thought i might still uh, play for them in a final or whatever. <laughs> exactly i was going to say what's going to happen is france are going to win there's going to be an injury in the second row and you're going to be back next week yeah for me for <laughs> me uh they need to win so that i have another opportunity to maybe join the team and so the so, team can improve when Paul gets there. The team loves uh, to get better. <laughs> you said it, Johnny. You said it. Paul did not say that. You said it. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. I think uh, yeah. I think uh, obviously the French team is going to win. Um, but how much? I'm not sure. Bro. It's just this is typical. It's then, tricky. Eh? We haven't even spoken about the fact in if you if you throw a red card or a yellow card in there, which we've seen in this World Cup, is it's like a massive thing. Like have you seen the stats when they showed the that they saw on the social media the the stats making the round when we weren't even um, half uh, we were we were a third into the World Cup and we already beat like all the last uh, 2019 World Cups records of of cards. Which is quite interesting and concerning at the same time. I think we're mid fifties, bro. I think we're at yeah. fifty. I think it's forty something or fifty something cards oh. already in the competition, which is oh. insane. But it still yeah. it takes it takes me back to like if France win this game, they make a final because if they get through this game, the semifinals against either Fiji or England, yeah. and like that. I think that will be a more straightforward game. Yeah. Sorry, Tim. Than the South Africa <laughs> test. So, yeah. but but it takes me back to I think the one side, the one team on this side of the draw now that can cause France the biggest issues is South Africa with the physicality. Yeah. The one side on the side the side of the draw that can stand up to France and make it really difficult. Um, mm. Even going back to that game in Marseille a year ago, that was thirty twenty six to France with South Africa having a red card for like sixty plus minutes. So like that just yeah. shows you how difficult this game is but like having been in the stadiums having seen the french crowds like i think the french boys will have grown in confidence as well it's almost like they've embraced this competition there doesn't look to be any negative pressure i think damian peno perfectly represents that the sort of not stifler mentality for everyone that's a silly thing to say but like there's a guy playing no pressure confident yeah. settled in systems believes in himself and i i don't think they're going to beat south africa by a big score I think it yeah. might be something like it was 30 points to 26, a difference of one score, yeah. four points. But I believe they can beat yeah. them by by that type of score this weekend, yeah. which would allow Paul to come back in for a semi and a final. Yeah. Possibility. And nail that down. But yeah, I, I think it's gonna be class. But I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go for a tight French win as well. I was gonna ask Johnny about the other games when we've done Paul, but we might as well do it while you're here. Give us your view. What what let's talk about the other Johnny's written England and Fiji's chances off in a semi final already. But give us your view on that one. Who's winning that England or Fiji? I'm going for, for the Fiji boys, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh yeah, just just uh, for the dream, you know, just for the dream. I I think that would be awesome for rugby in general. Um and I really think that I have a good chance if they play if they play like they did against Wales and uh, and Australia, uh, bro, yeah, that if in if they bring that that type of physicality and gameplay that they did, but then you sh- they definitely have a chance, a big chance to you know, to win against England. Like I- I- England could easily lose that game. Like this, sh- this is bad. I saw I saw I saw somebody getting picked up. I think it was Drew Mitchell saying. You know, Australia should never lose to to Fiji, or they shouldn't lose to Fiji. Fiji Fiji have some wonderful players, some outstanding talent, but England have always been too well organized and too structured and too difficult to beat. And you just don't see that anymore. You see it in fits and starts. Like you saw it against Argentina, and then you saw nothing against Samoa. So England are so hard to pin down that I don't know what version of them is going to be out at the weekend. What I would love to see is another Fijian performance where they carry with purpose, where they break the gain line, where they offload, everything that we love seeing in Fijian rugby. Um, 
it's just whether England try and kick them to death and allow them to do that. So I also would love to see a Fijian win at the weekend. You'd love to see it, Johnny. Of course, you're Scottish, but do you think it's going to happen? <laughs> well, but the thing is, like, see the gate last weekend, England Samoa. I was like, that should be comfortable for England. They should win that at a canter. They win it by one point. I know they still win, but they mm. weren't convincing at all. And and so much that they did, they're I don't know, they're so difficult to break down. And, and there's one thing, like I think if my head was on it, I'd be like, England should win that game four times out of five. But they also got absolutely humbled at Twickenham a, a month ago by Fiji. Um, and they haven't looked consistent. So I don't know. Fiji, Fiji again, worrying, losing last game against Portugal. Yeah. You don't know. England should win that game, but my hope is that Fiji win the game. Yeah, let's say the best England of all their performance now in the World Cup and the best Fiji performance of the World Cup. Then you think win. I'm still with Fiji, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I think if it's best against best, yeah, England should, should win it, but... Um, yeah, if they if they bring a performance like they did against Samoa and Fiji brings like, the performance they did against Australia and, and, and Wales, it's really going to be difficult. It's a close run thing, and if that is a close run thing, Wales Argentina is tough to call as well, isn't it? No, nah, for me that's easier. I think Wales Wales will bring that too. Yeah, Argentina haven't looked convincing either. I actually really enjoyed the Argentina Japan game at the weekend. I think that's the best yeah. game. That was a, that was a weekend of some great games. But I, I don't know. Argentina just haven't fired, whereas Wales seem to be like pre-comp getting absolutely smoked by South Africa and looking a bit lost. All of a sudden, like galvanized, play well, physical, peaking well. They look explosive. So, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give that to Wales as well, Tim. Okay, and then the other big one in Paris, Ireland All Blacks. What do you reckon, Paul? Yeah, well, Ireland is basically really on form at the moment. So yeah, they. I think they they pull out the win against New Zealand. I'm also going to go Ireland, mate. Um, <laughs> number one team in the world. They've been there for three years. They went down and won in New Zealand last summer. They won their summer tour there. I don't know. I've got a feeling like this is their time to sort of get rid of that hoodoo and get to a semi. Um, they're definitely good enough. They're settled. They've got some old heads in there. They're so comfortable on the ball. Like, it's crazy. Their performance against South Africa was amongst the best that I've seen, like finding a plan B, C, and D to beat a South African side. So I think Ireland are going to win that game. That being said, an all-black side written off, underdog, is dangerous. Um, but I, no, I, I just think Ireland have got too much. Ireland have got too much, and they'll make it through to a semi. Thanks so much for joining us, Paul. Good luck with the 40 minutes this weekend, if you get it. And hopefully... Fingers crossed. We don't want to wish bad luck on anyone else, but we might see you back in a semi and a final. It'd be great to see. No, no, thank you very much. Enjoy Corsica, mate. Yes. Bye. Enjoy, enjoy your flight with your family. Yeah. <laughs> enjoy your thousand pound, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. It is yeah. what it is. They call it the idiot tax, Paul. Like when you make a mistake like that, it's just oh, pay, it's... pay the thousand pounds and get on with it. School of life, that is. School of life. <laughs> my problem is I'm a tit that's my problem man <laughs> basically but it's done it's yeah. done eat yeah. that shit sandwich and enjoy it hey making memories these, these our kids might never get through this again so yeah. making memories it's worth it it'll be even better Finn, when you remind Finn that you paid twice for his travel like in 10 years time <laughs> he'll appreciate it even more and when we look back at the images of him sitting watching Peppa Pig or whatever it is <laughs> and not watching the game it'll be worth it it'll be great memories <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. nice shot, guys. Okay, mate. Enjoy yeah. Corsica. Enjoy. Thanks, bro. Cheers. Always good to hear from Paul Johnny, friend of the show. Um, he, he, obviously, we can tell we knew already how dark it is when something like that happens right on the eve of the tournament. Literally, a deadline for squad submission. Interesting hearing the background behind that. It's his, it's his second time as well. But yeah, and we chatted to him just before the game against South Africa in the autumn that he missed. We, we, we know all the background, but at least he's back physically in a good place. And you just never know. You never know. And you always want nice things to happen to good people. And he's a great boy. So, I mean, you don't want to wish well on other people. The only way he's going to get in now is if there's a little 
niggle or an injury picked up and then he gets to jump on board for the semi or final if he makes it through. So it'd be nice for him to make that memory for his family as well, for everything he sacrificed and the family has gone through because it isn't easy, mate. Like It's one of those things. Like, you can even tell talking to him there, he's done us a service because he's a mate by coming on, but you can still tell it's painful to talk about. So wish him the best. It's not easy to go through. It'd be lovely for him to get a bit of game time or get some involvement at the tail end of the competition, which will be very hard. But again, it couldn't happen to a nicer bloke. If it is to happen, he deserves it. And you mentioned when we were chatting to him just then, obviously mouth-watering ties in the quarterfinals, but there's some great games last weekend. So we should find out what your meter moment of the week is, Johnny. Uh, my, I loved Samoa running England close. That would have been epic if they'd won that. Um, the Japan Argentina game from both sides, some outstanding rugby, running rugby, offloading, probably one of the best finishes from a second row you'll ever see. Yeah, if you go back and watch the highlights of that game, um, in space, finishes from 50 meters out, a chip and chase, but not even that could beat the Portuguese boys who I think have stolen everyone's hearts and everyone's minds a side that wasn't even meant to be there come the start of the competition they've taken spain's spot and they've absolutely run with it lovely rugby really fluid play they've been consistent and thrown together some great stuff in every single game but to finish with a flourish to nearly force fiji out and to see australia sneak through the back door um by beating fiji in their last game and the manner of that victory as well like playing positive rugby in the last minute at the death to see the reaction of the players, how much it meant to them. I'm not sure if you've seen, but like the fan reaction back home, them arriving yes. back yeah. in port. I mean, just amazing to see. And that's what you want. That's what you want the, the rugby landscape to look like is to create these moments and more of these moments in World Cups for these players, for the fans, and to throw it further around the world. So the Portuguese boys have been superb and you just hope now they get to build on it. I know most of them are still semi-pro at best, a lot of them amateur, but more games against better opposition so that come four years time they're in an even better position to qualify and then to threaten even more big sides in the competition so they've been class and they are easily the meter moment of the week probably the competition so far um and i can't wait to see more of them yeah i think tough to argue with that probably the meter moment at the pool stage as i reckon that portugal that was Johnny's meter moment of the week and meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue in the oven or in a pan and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus you can get 10% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FrenchPod10 at checkout. That's FrenchPod10 and you'll get 10% off any full price item at meter.com. Thanks, Johnny. Massive thanks to Paul Willemson for joining us. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Catch you next week, mate. Bye.